so the um the dimension and the practice that I chose to, to go along with this story is practice three, discover our stories, the interpersonal dimension, which is we discover the transformative power of our stories by sharing our stories with others and inviting others to share their stories with us, paying special attention to peoples and creatures whose stories have been silenced. And um, I've titled this story, A Persistent Call. And it relates to um, the Lenten um, program that we're going to be offering uh, related to uh, the Doctrine of Discovery. So um, when I was a child, um, I, I, I first became aware, of course, as, as many of us did, the very um, difficult and conflicted and unjust history uh, in relation to Native American peoples in this country. But in particular, I became aware in maybe middle school um, that I had a particular family history um, that, that related to the treatment of the Cherokee, um, particularly in Oklahoma, because um, I learned that my uh, two great grandfathers on my mother's side had participated in the Cherokee Strip run to open up Indian territory, uh, which had been, had this part of Oklahoma had belonged to the Cherokee Nation, and to open up that uh, area for white settlement. And that's how um, my great grandfathers and grandmothers got their land in Oklahoma, and why my mother was born in Oklahoma. And so I became um, sensitized uh, to that personal dimension of uh, native settler history um, as a child. Um, and then um, when I was in seminary and beginning to think about doing doctoral work, I, I, I developed the insight that my own passion for uh, eco-justice and for ecological healing for the planet and for promoting economic development for poor people and nations, this, this um, passion that I had for dealing with both um, environmental and um, at the time, the, I, the way I thought of it was environmental and economic justice was deeply tied to um, injustices and in treatment of, done to and treatment of indigenous peoples around the world. And I realized uh, back then, this would have been the early 90, 1990s, that the only way towards what was already then being articulated as the call for sustainable development, um, that the only way path that would be sustainable and um, actually get us where we wanted to go in terms of sustainable development was to learn from indigenous peoples and to work for justice for indigenous peoples to listen to their voices. So I decided to build that into my PhD program and my dissertation work at Union Theological Seminary. Then there was a, a seminal moment that I wanted to share when I had the opportunity to see a film called In the Light of Reverence at the National Museum of the American Indian New York City campus. And as I viewed that film, I felt a distinct call. I, I just felt it come upon me, this sense of, of, of being called to help Christians in particular understand the Native American view of the sacred. Because I could see then, uh, and this film sets it up beautifully, the way this clash, this cultural and worldview clash between Christian and Native peoples or non-Native Christians and Indigenous peoples um, was creating a lot of havoc and particularly really damaging um, the earth and Indigenous peoples. And then I felt a sense of call to help Christians understand and respect Indigenous worldviews and experiences of the sacred. Then my doctoral research took me to the um, Aquasasne Mohawk Reservation in upstate New York, which is on the St. Lawrence River and, um, and straddles, in fact, uh, two nations going into Canada. And um, I went there uh, to learn from the uh, Haudenosaunee Environmental 
task force leaders and some of the elders of the Mohawk people. The Mohawks are one of the six nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And at that time, I learned about the extreme toxic pollution of the St. Lawrence River and the wetlands all around and in the Akwesasne Reservation from nearby industrial plants that had created several Superfund sites and how these, um, these uh, toxic impacts had a much greater uh, destructive impact on indigenous peoples than on non-indigenous peoples on the surrounding white communities because of how native people use the land and the species work with the species of the land for cultural and religious practices as well as direct livelihood and subsistence. Later on in I think 2011, I had the opportunity to meet Chief Oren Lyons, one of the most prominent leaders and elders of the Onondaga Nation, another of the six nations in the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and I had a chance to interview him. He's internationally known for his work on indigenous sovereignty and the doctrine of discovery. And I asked him, I said, how could I best support indigenous people in the US in, in your quest for sovereignty and justice as a Christian pastor and Christian ethicist? What can I do? And he said very clearly, work with other Christians to repudiate the doctrine of discovery. He said, that is the most important thing you can do because that's the keystone on which it all rests. All the injustices done to native people, it's all based in this doctrine of discovery, which I had heard of, but I didn't know as much about as I clearly needed to know. And I have to admit, I wasn't expecting such a direct and clear and precise answer. I mean, it was very specific. For quite a while after that, though, I was immersed in pastoral ministry. I was no longer in academia, and my ability to focus on this sense of call that I had had years back for Indigenous people got kind of put on the back burner. There were times I was able to build it into my pastoral work, my preaching and teaching, but it wasn't a key focus, and I felt bad about that at times. When I stopped working full-time in ministry, though, after my mom died and during the pandemic, I was able through Ecofaith Recovery to start picking that call up again through our work with the Woodleys and Ayla Hay and the Lenten devotional that some of us created. Um, and now this year with the book study on Becoming Ken and our planned Lenten focus on Sarah Augustine's book, The Land is Not Empty, Following Jesus in Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery. And Lo and behold, I found as I started um, investigating and, and learning about the Just Faith Ministries program, which some of us are thinking of offering, which in Lent, which is actually built around this book, I learned that in that program, the Just Faith Ministries program, the land is not uh, our own, um, they have a, a session where they focus on what happened in Akwesasne. And they focus on the toxic pollutants and the super fun sites and, and what, what that did to the people of Akwesasne. And uh, I just felt like, well, it just felt like a sign. I mean, if I'd had any doubts about whether it was worth investing my time and effort in doing the Just Faith program, which is going to be a, a fuller and granted much more um, a higher commitment level and higher uh, level of time investment required than um, only doing a book study on this book. But I realized that it, it just felt like a sign that um, I should facilitate this, this program in order to um, get some of the fuller, the fuller look at these issues. And, and it also felt like a sign to me that this calling that I had felt all those years ago in the early 1990s was coming full circle, that this calling was alive and well and more important now than ever. So what's the takeaway from this story? For me, it's about trusting that strong sense of inner conviction, that sense of call 
to move in a particular direction, to take up a particular cause when it comes to you, to trust that even if it waxes and wanes and you don't live into it perfectly or consistently, if it's a true calling, it'll keep coming back. It'll keep calling your name and giving you more opportunities to show up and live into it. And it's trusting that God or the universe or great mystery will give you the resources you need when you need them to live out that call. So I wonder when and how you have felt called to a particular path or work and how have you responded and how is that calling active in your life now?